Good evening to the Newark Baptist Temple. Let's take our hymn books together and stand and turn to number 318, Hallelujah for the Cross. Let's stand together. on paper that's a wide range in that song you start out so low and then go really high some of you look like you were singing it with ease or lip syncing I'm not sure which <laughs> but I love the message of the song would you pray for a couple of families um, that are recently grieving uh, remember Doug Albright 
And for those of you that have a newer printing of the uh, church directory, I would encourage you to check on him, to call him, or to go by and visit him. He lives out near the Walmart there in, on 21st Street. And uh, remember that his wife, Miss Pam, passed away a couple weeks ago. We've not seen him back in church since then, but it'd be good to check on him and make sure he's okay. And I'll try to do that this week. But if you have access to his address or telephone number, it'd be great if you could check on him as well. And then I mentioned on Wednesday the Tolbert family. They were a family from Coleman, Alabama that attended here for a couple of years. Uh, while they lived in the area, they'd usually sit up right here on the second or third row. And uh, Mr. Tolbert got a job in Tech, Texas, so they moved a couple years ago. Their adult daughter stayed behind, and she was beaten and strangled by her boyfriend. Um, uh, I think it was about a week ago. And they were going to, they fi finally decided she's brain dead. There's nothing we can do for her on um, Wednesday. And my understanding from the text that I received, I'd been there Wednesday morning, was that they were going to disconnect her on Wednesday. So I just assumed she had passed on Wednesday. Of course, I was out of town Thursday through Saturday. But I received a text yesterday that she actually passed away around 6 p.m. yesterday. Mm -hmm. So I would assume, brain dead, she wouldn't have been able to survive without the, the life support. Um, they must have waited a few days to disconnect. Sometimes it takes families a little while to kind of come to peace with that. But if you would please pray for David and Connie and uh, the, daughter's, uh, the daughter's name was Tala. She was named after the Talladega Speedway in Alabama. And uh, pray for her little brother, Miles. He's in sixth grade. And uh, they're still in the area, maybe for a few more days uh, while there's some legal things going on. But pray for them in their time of grief. It's bad enough to lose a loved one, but to lose the loved one in that way um, is very devastating. So I know they would appreciate your continued prayers for them. Let's go to the Lord in prayer for the service and pray for these grieving families as well. Brother Mossman, would you lead us tonight, please, sir?
Let's take our hymnals again, turn to number 309, There is a Fountain. Let's stand together. come to receive the offering this evening. Let me mention something you may have seen announced on the slides here on the screens in the auditorium, but I want to make sure that you've taken note of it. On Sunday, we'll have a beautiful springtime photography backdrop hanging in the overflow room because it's highly improbable that everything's going to be green and in bloom. And um, being Easter is so early, but it really is a beautiful picture. And I've actually, part of the picture is shown on the screen. So this is what we're inviting you to do. Bring your cell phones, bring your cameras. I'll have a simple tripod back there. And you can take a selfie of your family. And everybody will think, wow, you must live in a beautiful part of the country. And uh, you can join us now. We actually have it hanging now, but it's on the back side of that blue curtain. So I've got to turn it around and steam the, the backdrop so that it'll be ready for Sunday. But it'll be a really nice picture place. And of course, you could come in and do that before Sunday school or between Sunday school and church or after church. And we'll probably leave it up throughout the week so that if you want to 
uh, get a picture and you can't get it on Sunday, you can do that. But it'd be a great time to do it on Easter Sunday. We invite you to use it that way with your family or just by yourself if you want to. That's fine too. I've actually taken several selfies of myself just just because I wanted to see does it look real. Okay, that's all it was. It's not, I don't take selfies of myself typically. I don't even like looking at myself in the mirror, Brian, but you know, on a camera for sure. There's nothing, nothing worse than be flipping through your phone to show a friend, you know, a deer that you shot, and then all of a sudden there comes up, there's a page of your selfies. It feels really embarrassing as a guy when you do that, you know, but so try not to do that. All right. Our missionaries of the week are the Adesinas serving the Lord in Nigeria and our ministry of the week, Lighthouse Legal Ministries. Let's pray for both of these every day this week that the Lord would bless and use them. Brother Richards, would you lead us in prayer, please, sir? Stand together and take our hymnals one last time. Number 347. There's room at the cross for you. Let's stand together and take our hymnals. Number 347.
Wasn't that a blessing? That was good. Most of this group sang in a competition, fine arts competition, in Cleveland a couple weeks ago. I believe that group placed first. And I think we're missing at least one of our students. So it was good to have Drew singing with that group as well. And he filled in well. Pray for several of them. Three of our students will be going to nationals here in a couple of weeks in Greenville, South Carolina and competing. James will get to compete in sermon competition. And Addie and Caroline will be competing in a duet. Caroline will be competing with a solo as well. I think, is it, are you, is it just vocal solo or piano? No, not piano, just vocal solo, because you do one individual, that's right. So looking forward to hearing good things from them in Greenville as well. You pray for them as they go down to do that. I want you to take your Bibles and turn with me to uh, Colossians tonight. So we began a series last week that is a doctrinal series, a doctrinal topical series. It is important that we know Bible doctrine. The word doctrine simply means teaching our truth, and we need to know doctrine. There have been movements, even in the last 50 years, where some people have suggested that doctrine divides, and so we don't need to teach doctrine. If we all love Jesus, that's good enough. And uh, there were um, there was a movement back in, I think, the early 90s. How many of y'all remember the Promise Keepers movement? Do you remember the Promise Keepers movement? Okay, it sounds good, right? Be a promise keeper. Uh, but actually, that, that movement promoted what is called ecumenism, the idea we just all need to come together and uh, we don't need to have any distinctions or differences. Let's just all be promise keepers and we'll de-emphasize doctrine. But what the Bible speaks to, we need to know what the Bible says, and we need to stand for what the Bible says. And there are some divisions that need to be made between truth and error. And so tonight, we're going to look at really a detailed subject regarding the God-man, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's more detailed than we would typically get into on a Sunday evening, but this is important. So I want to encourage you to try to pay attention and follow along, make some notes on some things you can follow up on later. But we're looking at our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. The title of the series I've given it is Let God Be True from Romans chapter 3. Let God be true and every man a liar. We want to expose the ideas of human religion to the light of God's truth. So let's see what Scripture says about Jesus. Colossians chapter 1, beginning at verse 12. Follow along as I read. Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Now that's a mouthful right there. Think about it. We ought to give thanks to the Father because He's made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. When you think about what you've been given, it's been given to you in Jesus Christ. And God should be praised for that. Verse 13. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of His dear Son in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Don't be alarmed by that idea of firstborn. It does not say that he was born first. It said he was firstborn. Firstborn is a position. And you think about it in many families. This is not always the case in our culture, but in many families, the firstborn will be the one who ends up perhaps as the executor of the will. The firstborn many times will be the one that kind of keeps the family together after the parents have passed away. Um, not always the case, but many times the case, it's a position. I am a firstborn, so I have an opinion about firstborns. And how many of you aren't firstborn, but you know firstborns always have an opinion? Okay, all right, yes, the rest of you understand that. But Jesus was firstborn. In other words, nobody was born again until, except that Jesus already had that relationship with the Father. It's not teaching that he was created in time because it goes on to, now think about this. It goes on to tell us that he's responsible for everything that was created in time. Look at verse 16. For by him were all things created. So everything that was created was created by Jesus. And if Jesus was a created being, he couldn't have, the, the verse wouldn't be true if Jesus were a created being because it says all things that were created were created by him. That implies that he wasn't created because everything was created by him that are in heaven and that are in the earth, visible and invisible. What does that mean? We're talking about spiritual forces as well. He's responsible for 
things that aren't part of the physical world necessarily, but about a part of spirit, the spiritual world. Visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he's before all things. And by him all things consist. Before all things. Why? Because he is the eternally existent Son of God. He is referred to in the Old Testament as being the one who was of old. That's a Hebraism for eternal. By him all things consist. I love the word consist. It literally means to hold together. I'm not a science teacher, nor should I meddle too deeply into science. But I've read just enough to know that we're not 100% sure why atoms stay together. Because their, cent their center is composed of like charges. Boys and girls, you know what happens if you take two magnets and you turn the positive ends together or the negative ends together and you try to put them together. When you let one go of one of them, it shoots across the room because positive charges repel, right? But the center of an atom, now there are theories about why an atom holds together, but they're theories. They're not certainty. Nobody's 100% sure why atoms don't just fly apart. Well, I don't know the technical reason, but I know the real reason. By him, all things consist. They hold together. I think about this. The atoms of your world are in the hand of your Lord. Everything holds together because of his sustaining power. Verse 18. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn. There it is again, from the dead. Now we're speaking of his resurrection. That in all things he might have the, what's the word, church? Preeminence. First place. The preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him, in Jesus, should all fullness dwell. If you want to know God, look to Jesus. Now Jesus' his disciples missed this point because they asked him in the upper room the night before he died. They said, Lord, show us the Father. And Jesus said, have I been so long with you and yet you've not known me? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Hebrews 1 describes him as the exact expression of the Father. If you pulled, poured God the Father into a mold, and uh, that's exactly what you have when you look at Jesus. God the, God the Son, I, I, what, you've heard me say this before. I despise the common theological expressions, first person of the Trinity, second person of the Trinity, and third person of the Trinity. Now, I believe the Bible teaches that God is Father, God is Spirit, and God is Son. But who said that Jesus is the second person of the Trinity? Your Bible didn't tell you that. Who said the Holy Spirit is the third person? Your Bible didn't tell you that. The theologians told you that. The reason I don't like those terms is because we end up looking at God in a vertical line as, okay, well, here's the top one, and we always think of the top as being the most of something, the best of something, the zenith of something. And then you have the second place. And then you have the third place. Our kids, when they went to competition, you know, some of them got first, some of them got second, some of them got third, some of them got an honorable mention. <laughs> you know, they, they, first, second, third person of the Trinity, that's not biblical terminology. If you're going to say first, second, third person, take that vertical list and turn it on its side. Because the point is, God is spirit, God is son, God is father, and the Spirit is no less God than the Father, and the Son is no less God than the Father. But the Son is not the Father. The Spirit is not the Father. There are three distinct persons, one God, but they're, they're all one God. You say, boy, that's hard to understand. I agree. But what's important is that we state truth about God the way the Bible states truth about God. And this nonsense about first, second, and third person of the Trinity. Now, you, you'll hear conservative people say that. You'll probably hear again. Brother, Bill may, Brother Will may say this next week in the pulpit, okay? Second person of the Trinity. And you just smile and nod and be respectful and know that if somebody says that, they don't know what they're talking about, okay? The Bible, <laughs> the Bible does not say Jesus is the second person of the Trinity. He is fully God. The Spirit is fully God. The Father is fully, and probably better for me to say, truly God. He's truly God. 
And so look at verse 20. And having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. Who is this Jesus? Some of you may remember me saying this back around Christmas time, and these are not original words with me, but they are some of the, the best and simplest, most succinct expressions of the deity and humanity of Jesus that I could give to you, and I ask you to think on them tonight. Nothing about God's humanity diminishes his deity. Nothing about his deity diminishes his humanity. Can I make it a little simpler for some of our young ones? The fact that Jesus is God doesn't take away from the fact that he is man. The fact that Jesus is man does not take away the fact that he is God. He is as much God as though he were not man at all and as much man as though he were not God at all. He is truly God and truly man. He is eternally God, but in time he humbled himself and became obedient to the death. He became man so that he could represent us and represent God to us. Let's think for a moment this evening about the humanity of God, the deity of God, and then the joining of those natures. First of all, the humanity, excuse me, the humanity of Jesus, the humanity of Jesus. Jesus had a human parentage. He had a human mother and a human, if you will, stepfather. Joseph biologically was not Jesus' dad. That's what the virgin birth is all about. But Mary was biologically Jesus' mother. We read of that in Luke chapters 1 and chapter 2. We hear him described in Galatians 4.4 as being made of woman, meaning that his physical body was formed in his mother's womb just like our bodies were formed in our mother's womb. He had a human parentage. He had a human composition of body, soul, and spirit. Turn to Matthew chapter 26 with me tonight. In these Sunday night messages for the next few weeks, we will be doing a lot of turning. So while that's not the way we typically study uh, in a topical series like this, it's important that we get kind of the full picture of what the scripture says. And so come ready to let your fingers do the walking. Matthew chapter 26 and verse 12. For in that she hath poured this ointment, this is when Jesus is being anointed in Bethany. Um, actually, not in Bethany. No, this is, this is right before his death. And uh, let's back up and look at... Um, look at verse 6. Now, when Jesus was in Bethany, is in Bethany, when Jesus was in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, there came unto him a woman having an alabaster box of very precious ointment and poured it on his head as he sat at meat. Now, there are a lot of things about this that would seem odd to our culture. I mean, first of all, I don't want anybody pouring oil on my head while I'm eating unless it's bacon grease. <laughs> right? But there's something very special happening here. The woman having this alabaster box of very precious ointment it poured it on his head as he sat at meat. But when his disciples saw it, they had indignation. They got mad, saying, To what purpose is this waste? For this ointment might have been sold for much and given to the poor. And when Jesus understood it, he said unto them, Why trouble ye this woman? The woman, for she hath wrought a good work upon me, for ye have the poor wi always with you, but me ye have not always. For in that she hath poured this ointment on my, what's the word? Body. She did it for my burial. Jesus said this is, has prophetic significance because I'm about to die. What did they do when someone died? They anointed their bodies. It was, a simply, it was essentially the ancient form of uh, similar to embalmment. And Jesus said, this is foreshadowing my soon death. He had a body. He had a soul. Look at verse 38, Matthew chapter 26 and verse 38. Jesus is on the cross, or he's headed to the cross. And Matthew chapter 26, verse 38, Then said he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful 
even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. Now God has made us, perhaps to mirror the Trinity, He's Trinity in whose image we were created, He's made us a tri tripart, body, soul, and spirit. We've seen Jesus had a body, now Jesus has a soul. But turn over to Mark chapter 2 and look at verse 8 with me. Just a few pages over, Mark chapter 2 and verse 8. Verse 2 says, Straightway many were gathered together in so much that there was no room to receive them, no, not so much as about the door, and he preached the word unto them. And they come unto him and bring one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. So this is the occasion when they lowered the sick man, the palsied man, down through the roof. And um, when Jesus, verse 5, when Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. And most of the crowd was surprised by that on a couple scores. Number one, they didn't think this guy showed up to have his sins forgiven, but to have his palsy healed. And number two, how dare this man think he can forgive sins? Verse seven, why doth this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sin but God only? Where did they say that? They said it in their hearts, according to verse six. In verse eight, and immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves he said unto them why reason ye uh, these things in your hearts i'm just saying to you that jesus had body soul and spirit you know the bible says in john chapter 4 verse 24 that god is spirit the holy spirit doesn't have a physical body the father doesn't have a physical body jesus did become man so he had a physical body he, but he was both man and god one person, all right, but he was human and he was divine. And the church has argued about this with liberals and Bible deniers uh, for 2,000 years. And we just want to make sure that we land in a place where the scripture teaches what we believe. He had a human composition, body, physical, soul, eternal, spirit, that part of us that can commune with God. Not only did he have human appearance and have human, excuse me, human parentage and human composition, but he had human appearance. If you had seen him, it would have been easy for him to blend into the crowd. You know, you might think, oh, no, 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 I would see his robes glisten and the brightness of his countenance. But that's not how the Bible describes Jesus. Um, he would have been the ordinary man. Now, there, there were, as far as the way he looked, there was the occasion on the Mount of Transfiguration where Peter, James, and John went up with Jesus and the Bible says that he was transfigured before them and his garments did glisten and they saw him with the glory that he had shared with the Father since from the time, uh, from before when time began. And, uh, you know, Peter got so excited on that occasion, you can just kind of hear him hyperventilating as he said, Lord, uh, why don't we build three tabernacles up here? Uh, Moses and Elijah had showed up that day too, which was quite a thing, considering they had lived hundreds of years before. And Peter said, Lord, let's build three tabernacles. Let's build one for Moses and let's build one for Elijah and let's build one, Lord, for, let's build one for you. And then there was a shadow that came over Jesus there on the Mount of Transfiguration, a cloud overshadowed him and a voice came out of the cloud that was the voice of the Father, God the Father. And he said, this is my beloved son. Hear ye him. Why well, shut my mouth, Peter thought. It's not time for me to talk. It's time for me to listen. Look at what's happening before me. That was a special occasion. But if you had run into Jesus in Nazareth, if you had run into him somewhere in Galilee, if you'd run into him in Capernaum, as far as how he looked, he looked like men looked in that day because he was indeed man. He had a human experience. We uh, we would go to verses, we'd look at John 4, verse 9, John 8, verse 57, but we find those throughout um, the gospel accounts. He also had human experiences, and I want to take a time to look up some of these. So let's begin with Luke chapter 2, Luke chapter 2, where we also find, of course, the account of Jesus' birth. And I want to just give you a list of experiences. If you think about it, these are the experiences of humanity. Many of us, if not all of us, have had these same experiences. Did you know that Jesus had questions? Luke chapter 2 and verse 46. And it came to pass that after three days they found him in the temple sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. Now, I'm not suggesting to you that the knowledge of Jesus was less than the knowledge of God. But what we find in Philippians chapter 2 is that Jesus suppressed his divine prerogative 
and lived as a man. And there are times where we can see his deity shining through, but there are other times where we see his humanity shining through. He, he did not stop being God, but he suppressed the prerogatives associated with his deity. And we see on this occasion him asking questions. He asked questions. He increased in wisdom. Look in chapter 2, verse 52. Jesus, this is the young boy, Jesus. Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. He grew up like Bronson is growing up. He grew up like DJ is growing up. Jesus learned by experience to obey his parents. How many of you believe that he obeyed his parents perfectly? He did, but he learned it by experience. He learned by experience what's it, what it's like when you're the one that's picked on in your class. He had experiences like we have experiences, um, but he grew through those things. He increased in wisdom. Uh, thirdly, he imposed limits on his knowledge. He imposed limits on his knowledge. In Luke chapter 11, we have the, the, the death and ultimately the resurrection of his friend Lazarus in Bethany. And Jesus asked them, where have you laid him? Why did he ask the question? Was it because he couldn't find out on his own or he didn't know in his own? No, it was because he was living as a human. He was suppressing his right as God in that moment and living with the kind of knowledge that human beings would have. He didn't stop being God, but he asked the question because he wasn't living in that moment with his full prerogative of being God. He didn't stop being God, but he was living as a man. He imposed limits on his knowledge. He prayed. Now think about that. God talking to God. Not a God talking to another God, but God talking to God. God the Son talking to God the Father. I hope one day in heaven that we will be allowed to understand with our um, eternal and glorified minds what it means for God the Son to be in fellowship with God the Father. To be able to talk to God, God the Son, talk to God the Father. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. But then we see him talking to the Father, praying to the Father. We do that, don't we? We pray to the Father. Jesus taught us to pray, our Father which art in heaven. We talk to him. I'll tell you, I talk to the Holy Spirit and talk to the Son too. Say, so well, you're not supposed to do that. I told you before how John and Rice, somebody picked on him one time because he began his prayer, Precious Holy Spirit. Somebody came to him and said, you're not supposed to do that. You're supposed to pray to the Father. He said, yeah, but when you know them like I do, you're allowed to talk to the whole family. <laughs> well, we are told in the New Testament, in the book of Romans, for instance, um, that we're to call upon the name of the Lord. Who's the Lord? Jesus is Lord. Okay, so it's fine to talk to the Lord Jesus too, but... Um, when Jesus was telling us how to pray, he began that prayer with our Father. And so we pray. It's a human experience to pray. And then uh, not only did he ask, ask questions and uh, increase in wisdom, impose limits on his knowledge, he prayed, but he was tempted. Hebrews 2 verse 18 says, He was tempted in all points like as we are, but what's the rest of that? Yet without sin. In every point, what does that mean? John talks about us being tempted in areas of the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, this drive to have and to be and to do. He was tempted in all of those areas, but he did not sin. You say, well, was it really temptation if he couldn't sin? Some people argue about, could Jesus have sinned if he had wanted to? It's kind of a non-question. It's like asking a question, can God invent a rock so heavy he can't lift it? If you roll, you, everybody, should we just practice rolling our eyes at that question? That's the question that bored seminarians quit or sit around and come up with. All right, can God invent a rock so heavy that he cannot lift it? Either way, you're going to ascribe something to God that you think that he cannot do. That's a silly question. But um, when we think about him being tempted, was it really temptation if he didn't have the capacity to sin? We're, no, we're told in Matthew chapter 4 and Luke chapter 4 that he was tempted in the wilderness, driven out in the wilderness by the Holy Spirit for the purpose of being tempted by the devil. And we know that he did not succumb to that temptation. He didn't sin at any point. But when you read in James chapter 1 and verse 13, it tells us that God cannot be tempted with sin, neither tempteth he any man. 
It would seem to say that that, that that means, verse 13 means, number one, either Jesus was not God, or number two, Jesus could not be tempted, which would seem to make the, um, uh, the, the Gospels wrong. But no, 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 that's not the case. Turn with me to James chapter 1. These ver- I, you need to land your, put your eyes on these verses because I, I don't want these ideas to be fuzzy in your head. The scripture is perfect. And what it says about Jesus is true. And there is no contradiction here. But sometimes we get things mixed up in our mind. James chapter 1 verse 13. Let no man say when he's tempted of God, I'm tempted. Excuse me, let me no man say when he's tempted, I'm tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth any man. Now, notice what it goes on to say. Let ev- but every man is tempted... Was Jesus a man? Yeah. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Notice that, his own lust. Now here's the question. Could Jesus be drawn away by his own lust? No, he had a perfect nature. Lust here doesn't necessarily mean some wicked, evil desire. But Jesus' desires were incapable of leading him astray because he didn't have his own desires to do what was wrong. Sometimes I want to do what's wrong. Somebody, sometimes somebody aggravates me and I want to tell them off. It's just my desire. I'd feel much better for a few minutes if I could just do it, you know. Um, when I traveled with Pensacola Christian College, we had the name of the college on the side of the van. And there were many times we'd have to think about what we did. I'd really like to honk at that person raise my fist to them or whatever, but we got the college name on the side. We thought it'd be great if the sign was on with magnets, you know, so you could pull it off when you wanted to act like an unsaved person, but that's not the way we did it. Now, the the distinction between Matthew 4.4, Luke 4.4, where Jesus is let out in the wilderness and we're told that he's tempted, and James chapter 1 is in Matthew chapter 4, the temptation that came to Jesus was a pressure from the outside. It was, he was pressed on with temptation outwardly, but he never gave in to it because he was the perfect holy son of God and there was nothing in him that wanted to do what the pressures from without were suggesting he should do. Nothing, wanted, nothing that he wanted to do. So when you come to James and it says God can't be tempted with evil, you need to keep reading because it says every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. The point is, Jesus had nothing on the inside drawing him to sin. He did have things on the outside that were pressuring him to sin. James 1 is talking about temptations from within. Matthew chapter 4 is talking about temptations from without. Jesus could not be tempted from within because his character is perfect and holy. He's the Son of God and God the Son. Does that make sense? So he was tempted, yet without sin. He learned obedience. We read of that earlier in Luke 2. Hebrews also speaks about it. He thirsted. We read of that on the cross. At first they gave him gall and vinegar on a sponge that had a municipal, excuse me, um, uh, medical properties that would dull the pain that he was experiencing, and he refused it at the beginning of the crucifixion because he was there to suffer. At the end of the crucifixion, he took it, but not before he had suffered for our sin. But he thirsted. He experienced fatigue. Where was Jesus when the disciples were worried about the storm? On the Sea of Galilee. He's asleep in the bottom of the boat. And they're a little disturbed that he can sleep in the bottom of the boat. Why was he sleeping? Because he was tired. Yesterday I was driving back from Tennessee. I don't know, ty- driving is just tiring stuff. And I, I drove down on Thursday, and then on Friday I drove from Powell over to Murfreesboro and had an interview there and uh, conducted an interview there. And then I drove back yesterday, and I got, I don't know, maybe three, three hours down the road, I needed to stop for gas, and I pulled off. And I was so zonked out. I mean, I was really kind of exploring both sides of the interstate. So I just, I pumped gas, and then I pulled over in the corner of the gas station parking lot, and slept for an hour. I didn't mean to sleep for an hour, but I fell asleep for an hour and then was able to drink a couple of Coca-Colas and keep going after that, but um, needed some caffeine in my system to help with that. But we get sleepy. It's part of the human condition. Some of you struggling with it tonight. Um, (laughs) No, actually, I haven't seen that tonight. He slept. He suffered pain. 
Some of you live with pain, don't you? Live with a lot of it. Your body's wearing out. It's growing old. My mother used to say, it's not the age, it's the mileage, son. It's the mileage that I put on this body. But you experience pain. You know, Jesus understands that. Pain isn't something that he takes lightly. He experienced it. He bled. Hey, I'm talking about things tonight that show us that he experienced what humans experience. And ultimately, Matthew 27, verse 50, he died. They say two things are sure in life, right? Death and taxes. Well, Jesus said you ought to pay your taxes. He was asked about that. He said, you got a coin? Whose image is on it? Caesar's image is on it? Give to Caesar what's Caesar. Give to God what's God. God's. He paid taxes. He helped Peter pay his taxes. But he died. And he was buried. All of these 13 things that I've given to you tonight are human experiences. He also had human emotions. Human emotions. For sake of time, we won't look at all the scriptures together. But something that we read often of Jesus, we find in Matthew chapter 9 and verse 36, that he had compassion on others. Matthew chapter 9 and verse 36. I had the strangest request today that would be like a benevolence request, somebody who has need. It's not uncommon for people to stop by once in a while and want money and that sort of thing. But there was a man in a wheelchair today who pulled up outside and one of our church family spoke to him and I went out and talked to him. And he, what, he never asked me for money. He was talking to me about how he was sick and he needed some over-the-counter medicine. And it's not something you can make methamphetamine about or anything like that. It was actually stomach medicine. He was sick and he said, I can't access my money until tomorrow. I really need this. Could you get... Well, of course I got it for him. I mean, the man lived in a wheelchair to, be, to begin with, but I had to, I ran down to Walmart and got some. It, it would have been unthinkable to just drive on home and say, no, you just deal with your problem. We ought to have compassion on people. Um, Jesus had compassion on people. Matthew, look at it with me. Matthew chapter 9, verse 36 says, But when he saw the multitude, he was moved with compassion on them, because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep, having no shepherd. Jesus looked out over Jerusalem and wept for Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophet. How many times would I have sought to gather thee as a hen would gather her chicks under her wings and ye would not? He had compassion. That's a human emotion. He showed anger and sorrow. You might think that anger is always wrong, but I tell you, if you love someone, there are, there are right times that you can show anger. Uh, when Caroline was little and if I saw her run out in the road after I told her not to run out in the road and she came close to getting hit, I can picture me running across the yard and running out into the road and snatching her up. But I'm not going to say, oh, sweetheart, why did you do that? You scared daddy to death. I'm going to say, I told you not to do that. <laughs> She's going to think I'm angry at her. But the reason that I'm experiencing that emotion is because I care about her. I love her. Jesus experienced anger. We saw it in the temple where the money changers were making merchandise of things that were to be holy. And Jesus went in and he made a whip. I, just, I can just picture Jesus sitting there weaving some leather together. Peter says, Lord, what you doing? He said, you'll find out. <laughs> and he goes over and he takes the money changers tables, imagine this, and turns them over. This is your savior. <laughs> Cracks that whip and says, my father's house will not be a place of merchandising, but a house of prayer. He showed anger. Now, I'm not saying that all anger is justified, but some is, and Jesus experienced that. He showed sorrow. At the tomb of his friend Lazarus in, Math, in John 11, the shortest verse in the English Bible, he said, it says, Jesus wept. He wept. He knew sorrow. He wept. He rejoiced. We read of that this morning in Hebrews 12 too. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the majesty on high. He was troubled within himself. We read of that in the story of Lazarus, but also in other chapters throughout the gospel accounts where he was troubled about things. He agonized in the Garden of Gethsemane. We talked about it this morning where he sweat, as it were, great drops of blood, but he prayed in agony. You ever agonized about something? 
Have you ever had something that just caused so much turmoil in your inner man that you could hardly focus on anything else? Jesus has been there. He knows what that's like. Jesus became man. But not only that, we want to take just a moment to think about his deity. I promise not as much time as we've taken to think about his humanity. Notice that the Old Testament, the gospel accounts, Acts and the epistles all teach that Jesus is God. He's named God. In Matthew chapter 26, he's called the Son of God. When he claimed to be the Son, there were times that the Jews wanted to take up stones and kill him. Why? Because they understood that to be claiming equality with God or claiming to be God. The Jews understood he was claiming deity. In John 1.1 1, 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. A Jehovah's Witness comes and knocks on your door and says, Yes, but the living Word that you read about in John 1, it, it shouldn't really say, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. It should say that the Word was a God. And they'll say, In the Greek, there's no article before God. That's true. Did you know that? You remember your articles? We have indefinite articles like A and N. But we have a definite article, the. Well, in Greek, you don't have an indefinite article. You either have the article or you don't. So you have the D or you don't. They say, well, it doesn't say in the beginning was the word and the word was the God. It, just, it should say in the beginning was a God. But it's a very rudimentary, elementary understanding of Greek that somebody has that told them that. Because actually, in Greek, when you don't have the article, when you don't have the the, it's actually emphasizing the very essence of the noun. In other words, it's saying, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word in its very essence is God. <laughs> it's a stronger proof of the deity of Christ than anybody could have possibly have imagined just because of the language that we have there. He is God. In the Old Testament, we read of Jehovah. But when we compare passages from the Old Testament prophets to the New Testament, we find that Jesus is the one who's fulfilling prophecies of Jehovah. Look at Isaiah 44 and verse 6. Let me show you one of them tonight. Isaiah 44. And as soon as you've found Isaiah 44 and verse 6, go ahead and uh, put your finger there and then turn to the very end of the New Testament. Turn to Revelation chapter 22. Isaiah 44 and Revelation 22 and verse 13. Isaiah 44 and verse 6 says, Thus saith the Lord. Now, I want you to notice the capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. D. Your King James translators used all caps Lord to signify the word Yahweh or Jehovah. So this is the word Jehovah. Thus saith the Jehovah, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, the Jehovah of hosts, I am the first and I am the last, and beside me there is no God. Revelation 22, 13. And Jesus says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Jesus fulfills what Jehovah claimed of himself. By the way, Zechariah chapter 12 Prophecy of the battle in the valley of Megiddo. All of Israel's enemies surround Jehovah God is narrating the prophecy as, as um, uh, Zechariah chapter 12 opens. And when you come to the portion that talks about their deliverer, Israel prays for their deliverer and then they see him. And the Bible says with, G with Jehovah narrating in the Old Testament, Jehovah God says, and they will look on me whom they have pierced. Who is it that the Jews will have pierced? Jehovah is the one talking. Jesus is the one that was pierced. Jehovah of the Old Testament. Jesus of the New Testament. He is God. He's named God. He's worshipped as God. Christ acknowledged that worship belongs only to God in Matthew 4. During the time of temptation in the wilderness, he told Satan that only God should be worshipped. Human and angelic creatures routinely rejected worship. We see it in the, in the history book of the church in Acts. We also see it in Revelation where John was tempted to bow down before an angel and the angel said, see thou do it not. Don't, don't, don't bow before me. Peter rebuked Cornelius in Acts chapter 10 
for trying to worship. He, and then the angel rebuked John in Revelation 22. And you know that Christ never rejected worship. He received it in Matthew 14 and Luke 5 and Luke 24 and John 20. When somebody tried to worship Jesus, he accepted it. You know why? Because he's God. That's why. He's worshipped as God. He possesses the attributes of God. I wish we had time to look at all the scriptures. I'll mention them as we go along. We quoted first our Gospel of John 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. But we see there His, uh, his pre-existence in the beginning. God was already there. Jesus, the living Word, was already there. That's an attribute of God. His pre-existence. His life-giving power. He gives life. That's God's role. His immutability. Hebrews 13, 8, 8 says, Yesterday, today, and forever, Jesus is the same. He never changes. He's immutable. That's a character quality. How many of y'all change? At least outwardly we sure see the change, don't we? But yeah, we change. I change in what I want and what I don't want. There are things I used to hate, collards. The green, despised it. Couldn't stand the smell of it. Still don't like the smell of it. But then I had it one way that I liked it. I love collards when they're, when they're prepared right now, um, correctly now. I change. God does not change. He's always the same. Uh, the very essence of God. In our text we read earlier, we read from Colossians chapter 1, but Colossians chapter 2 and verse 9 says, um, For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, that is, everything that could be God is already there in Christ. There's nothing short. He possesses all those attributes of God. His omnipotence, that's deity. He's all-powerful. His omniscience, he's all-knowing. His omnipresence. Now, his physical form could not be in more than one place at one time, but he is God. The whole world exists in His present. He's present everywhere at once. He fills divine offices. He's creator. He's sustainer. He's the forgiver of sin. sins. He's the resurrection and the life. And He is judge. These are attributes or divine offices, I should say, of God. Now, let me just for a moment talk to you about the union of, the, of God and man. Jesus is the God-man. The theologians call it the hypostatic union. You don't need to know that word. But we're talking about the God-man union. Jesus was as much man as though he were not God at all and as much God as though he were not man at all. Since the very first century, the union of Christ, humanity, and deity has been misrepresented. The Ebionites denied the nature of Jesus. The Apostle John refuted this heresy in his gospel account in John 1 where he said in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses today still deny that essential nature of Jesus. But the scriptures declare that he is both God and man. The Gnostics denied the human nature of Jesus. They also refuted their heresy. Excuse me, John also refuted their heresy in his first epistle bearing his name. Um, it's interesting to see how 1 John, I've quoted to you John 1.1 1, 1 several times tonight, but look at 1 John toward the end of the New Testament and see how he begins his first letter or first epistle. You've got 1, 2, and 3 John. 1 John 1.1, 1, 1, that which was from the beginning, which we've heard, which we've seen with our eyes, which we've looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. You know, John was saying, don't, don't tell me what Jesus was and was not. I saw him. I touched him. I talked to him. And we have the record of his witness here in the inspired word of God. The Arians, those in my high school Bible class, have been learning about the Arian controversy that developed in the fourth century. The Arians affirmed the preexistence of Jesus, but they denied his deity. Again, the Apostle John answered that heresy in his gospel account. The Nestorians, they taught that two distinct persons indwelt the body of Christ, a human and a God. I don't even know how to pronounce this group's names. I'm going to say Eutychians. They taught that the existence of a third combination nature, so you don't just have Jesus and you don't just have God, but now you've got somebody entirely different, a third person. But how does the, God rep how does the Bible represent him? The union of Christ's human and divine natures, though it has been poorly explained, it's plainly declared in Scripture. 
Christ is one person possessing two natures, one divine and therefore eternal, the other human and generated in time, yet everlasting. So accept what the Bible says about Jesus. Is he God? Yes. Is he man? Yes. He was, we see his humanity when he stands at the tomb of a friend and he weeps. And we see his deity when he says, Lazarus, arise. And Lazarus does. We see his humanity when he's sleeping in the bottom of a boat. And we see him as God when he stands and says, peace, be still. And the storm is calmed. Our Savior, God, without question, became man that he might redeem us. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Why did he think it was robbery? Because that's who he was. He thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. God became man so that he could die on a cross for you and for me. Heavenly Father, help us tonight to praise our Savior as he deserves for what he's done for us. Help us to um, understand and stand for the truth of the scripture regarding his nature, both as God and man. And Lord, make us your faithful and spirit-filled witnesses of our Savior. Lord, may we share Christ and his salvation with others. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. If God spoke in your heart tonight, maybe you're just, your heart's been moved by who Christ is and what he's done for you. Take some time to worship him. If there's something that um, you need to talk to him about, you can take this time as the piano plays to speak to him in prayer. Take your hymnals and turn to number 242. Mrs. Nichols will sing 242 and 243. Just the first verse of 242 and then the chorus 243. The music will not be on the screen, so you'll want to book for this. 242 and 243. Let me remind you of an opportunity this week to help prepare for revival. Our prayer meetings, the Hughes' house on Tuesday night in Newark at 7 p.m. Mary Meyer's house Thursday night at 7 p.m. One hour prayer meetings, we invite you to come. Teenagers are welcome to come to that as well. We'd love for you to come and pray with us for an hour for revival needs. And then remember the opportunity to help us with canvassing. I'd sure love for us to have both vans full and overflowing on Saturday so we can get out another thousand of these flyers uh, before the special day on Easter. And then remember to take advantage of the opportunity to get a picture of you and your family uh, before or after the service on Sunday and the photo backdrop that we'll have up in the back of the auditorium. Let's finish our service tonight singing about the name of Jesus, number 242. There is a rest every moment. There is a rest.
God bless you. Have a great week. Go tell somebody about your Savior.